Well, joining us now, the Union Minister Rajiv Chandrasekhar. Thanks, Mr. Chandrasekhar, very much uh, for being with us. It's an important day today. Uh, the budget, one of the key points mentioned by the Finance Minister was on the Skill India mission, having trained 1.4 crore uh, youths. That's something that you deal with very, very closely. Um, in your estimate, how many of these individuals have actually gotten jobs or are in a position to shortly be employed? Look, uh, obviously, it's extremely difficult to tell you precisely what the the actual number of jobs that these people have got, because this is over a period of, as you know, the last five to six years. But from every sample survey that we, we, we do, we see very high percentage of these uh, people who have been skilled, reskilled or upskilled, uh, either making uh, upward mobility progress in a job that they already hold or get new jobs or are entering into something that they uh, look at as micro-entrepreneurship or self-employment. Vishnu, the reason this is important is that in 2014, uh, when Prime Minister Narendra Modi ji became Prime Minister, it is important for all of us to realize that after 65 years of independence, out of a workforce of 42 crore Indians that woke up every morning and went to work every day to feed their families and to look after their families, 31 crore Indians were unskilled and uneducated and therefore were being made to work without any skills or without any uh, formal education. This was the state of the uh, workforce in 2014, 65 years out of independence. And it is that uh, that the Prime Minister through Skill India Mission has deliberately, systematically tried to alter, tried to change. And with the national education policy, for example, when 1.5 crore youngsters would drop out of school every year and join the workforce without skills, the national education policy today ensures not one youngster drops out of school. If he drops out of school or she has to drop out of school for any reason, it drops out without skills because from the sixth standard onwards, skilling is made part of the curriculum. So it is a very qualitative <coughs> and structural uh, redrawing of how the government and how the country treated the youth and treated those in the workforce in our country. It was simply uh, a, a situation before 2014 where people were left uh, to their own devices, to their own fate, without the government uh, intervening to help them in any way. And now we have as a combination of education policy and the Skill India mission, we have, in a sense at least, uh, I, I don't claim to say that we have solved the entire problem, but we have certainly created a movement where skilling and education is creating opportunities uh, and creating p youth that are better aligned to these new emerging opportunities in our economy. You know, you're speaking about skilling, but there's also the entire aspect of innovation, which is found mentioned in the budget, a corpus of one lakh crore rupees with a 50 <coughs> year interest free loan. So, you know, the rate of return is absolutely minimal. Um, across sectors, including defense, that's something that interests you very closely. How important is this uh, as a key element of what, what we're trying to do in this country? Oh, absolutely. I think this is absolutely uh, a, a brilliant way to uh, quantify, if you want to call it, or realize this vision that the Honorable Prime Minister has, that uh, as the country, as our economy uh, throws up more and more of these opportunities, that these opportunities should be available to our youngsters, to our startups, to our entrepreneurs, to our larger companies, uh, and that there is uh, ample sources of credit and capital that is available to them to innovate, to research, and to become a nation where what we were for 30 years, a consumer of other people's technologies, to now become a nation actively, proactively, with the ambition of creating and being the producer of the technologies of the future, the innovative platforms, devices and products of the future. So I think 1 lakh crores <coughs> being given as a government low cost finance to an institution that will in turn uh, bring in additional resources and, uh, and make this capital available to this ecosystem of companies and startups and individuals who want to innovate and research is absolutely a game changer and a force multiplier in a, in a lot of ways to the ambition that we have to create a trillion dollar digital economy and a five trillion dollar economy. Yeah. A part of creating uh, a digital economy, a small part is of course the role of startups. 
um, tax benefits for startups have been announced as well. Do you believe that this is an important Philip for you know young innovators, young inventors who want to who have an idea and want to take it forward? No, look, uh, look, uh, Vishnu. You know, in 2021, from the ramparts of the Red Fort, 2022 rather, the Honorable Prime Minister said very clearly he laid out this vision of the India decade, a decade of technological opportunities. And he said something very, very, very deep and very meaningful. He said, in a lot of ways, the future of India is going to be architected, scripted, built by the energy, the determination, the resourcefulness of our younger generation of students and startups. And he has worked very, very hard, very proactively to make sure every tool every enabling uh, requirement that is required to catalyze this and grow this ecosystem of startups is in, is in place, whether it's policy, whether it's capital, whether it's institutional. And uh, <clears throat> we are seeing that. And I said recently on the 16th of January uh, on the National Startup Day that uh, what we have seen today, this 1 lakh startups and 112 unicorns are really just a tip of the iceberg. The next wave of startups uh, is what the country is prepping for, what the Prime Minister is prepping for. And all of these things that you see, the 1 lakh crores being set aside for research and innovation, uh, the policies to uh, further make startups easy to, to succeed, these are all in a sense engineered to ensure that there is more and more of this energy that is uh, in a sense driving this ambition of India to begin because of Bharat. I'm not sure there was a direct mention of artificial uh, intelligence or, or generative AI in, in, in this interim budget. It's, of course, a, a smaller document. Um, but going forward, is this an area of, of concern only to the extent that, you know, the export of digital services from Indian IT companies has been a huge value addition for the world's economy? I mean, it's, it's been a huge addition for our economy as well. Uh, therefore, with the... Uh, advent of AI and, and you know what <coughs> people are talking about the future is there a real fear that unless our companies adapt then the huge commerce that we generate uh, from the IT sector could be lost because the advantages of AI could be gained by anyone yeah no look I think one of the things that Vishnu we must realize is there is nothing static in technology what was the normal for technology in 2014 is certainly not the techn normal for the business model of technology in 2024 and will not be the normal for technology in 2029 or 2047. I think companies in tech, whether they are big or small, Indian or foreign, startups or large legacy companies, know that this is a constantly moving dynamic landscape. And so if your business model uh, revolved around uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago in, in uh, essentially arbitrage of labor and uh, you know, consultant consulting, uh, certainly you've seen the wave coming, you've seen the changes coming and you've adapted your business model. So I am not too concerned. You're seeing companies like Infosys and all of these companies uh, get very deeply into AI. And I am very, very confident that the leaders of our companies, the technology companies, understand very much what is to be done to pivot into these new opportunities and in a sense reposition the capabilities that have been built over the last decade into pursuing these huge big tectonic opportunities that are coming their way. And I, sus I, I, I will go out on a limb and tell you that AI for India represents a huge opportunity, a multi-billion dollar, multi-hundred billion dollar opportunity for Indian companies and Indian startups. And I'm beginning to see uh, many, many companies and many, many startups uh, really, really dig deep and uh, focus on AI. So I'm very extremely bullish about India AI. And I'm extremely bullish about Indian companies uh, really capitalizing significantly on the AI boom. Another area which I mentioned earlier really interests you. It interests both of us, the national security <coughs> and defense. You know, there's a release which, which has just come in and uh, which the government says a record of over 6.21 lakh crore is the allocation to the defense ministry, which is 4.72% more than the previous financial year. Very significantly, there is... Um, a 27.1% uh, of the total defense budget has been allocated for capital acquisitions at 1.72 lakh crores, which is substantially more than what it was in the past. 
the capital expense is uh, in the defense sector is where we've had problems because of our huge pensions just the business of running the defense ministry has cost us so much so if we are now finding funds for capital expenditure in defense is that not something that's important given the geostrategic environment that we exist in oh uh, absolutely vishnu and th this is really in a in a lot of ways this uh, interim budget is a report card on how the hard work the forward looking policies and the determination of our prime minister has qualitatively and quantitatively transformed our economy remember this is the same country we are all the same indians who had to sit in 2014 and uh, suffer the ignominy of being called the fifth uh, five fragile nations this is the same india that could not afford to buy a uh, modern fighter jets uh, and allow our uh, neighbors to do whatever they wanted with us because they thought we were too feeble and we were under uh, equipped to deal with these kind of uh, threats and uh, posturing and attacks this is the same india today that is today created so much of headroom in terms of government resources through growth through tax buoyancy through economic growth investment that is today modernizing our armed forces creating a future ready capability that will keep at bay anybody who wants to prevent our rise as an economic power we are certainly a step and a hop away from being the third largest economy in the world and there are certainly people in our neighborhood who would like to slow our rise down slow us down and an absolutely clear modern deterrent in terms of our armed forces is required not just in the geopolitical uh, context but in the context of protecting our rise as a nation and our, our our as our prime minister says our destiny our will and our desire to become a developed nation by 2047 and there are many people in our neighborhood vishnu you know that i don't have to tell the tell you their names who certainly are not going to be happy with this type china of, and pakistan uh, you in know, case of you were wondering but go, right, but go right ahead <coughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so therefore i think i am i am very very proud that a today we are a country that is able to certainly look after our own interest and our own terms and are able to project our uh, uh, our determination and force all across the world in a peaceful manner to protect other countries in the world and most importantly to create a home grown industry where none existed this is the same country that would buy a trainer aircraft from a chocolate manufacturing nation switzerland well while we had hals and while we had other companies in the country and we today do all of this on our own so i think certainly that particular aspect that you uh, mentioned is an is in many ways a representation of how far we have traveled as a country and an economy in the last 10 years a um, minister you know we uh, some time back quite a few months back we we had a very meaningful discussion on india's demographic dividend that's when india became the most populous nation in the world uh, that comes back into focus when the minister today spoke of the importance of a trinity of demography democracy and diversity which is essential in fulfilling our all our aspirations and there were three or four very specific women focused development incentives firstly the girl child age 9 to 14 vaccination against cervical cancer number 1 number 2 83 lakh self help groups with 9 crore women are transforming the rural socio economic landscape then she spoke about uh, lakhpati didis and the number of those going up to as much as 3 crores when we talk about our demographic dividend what is the role of women in helping us achieve our economic ambitions oh it is absolutely <coughs> it was always the case that women in our communities societies and in our economies uh, from traditional times played a very very important role but for many many decades they were really not given the kind of enabling environment for them to go step in and do all of these things that they could to their potential the the biggest and the most important thing that i certainly <clears throat> go out of my way to uh, to come, uh, say that i admire my prime minister for is the way in the last 10 years he's transformed the lives of women of india whether it is the Uj ujwala scheme whether it is the har ghar jal pani scheme in terms of the basic empowerment and dignity swachh bharat scheme at the basic level of dignity of women to creating opportunities in government and outside government 
for women, ranging from the police to the armed forces to fighter pilots. And look, when we saw on January 26th, the Republic Day that was dominated by women in the paramilitary, women in the armed forces, flying, sailing, uh, undersea, <coughs> it is certainly uh, very clear in my mind, uh, whether it's a woman in a self-help group, whether it is a woman uh, looking after her household in a village in Haryana or Rajasthan or anywhere in the country who had to suffer uh, you know, for water or health for their children. There has been a deep, decisive transformation in their lives, not just from a point of view of health, wellness and social security, but also from a point of view of opportunity and growth and independence. So I think this has been a decade in a lot of ways where a whole ecosystem of opportunity and dignity has been built almost from scratch by Prime Minister Narendra Modi ji for the women of India. And I am certainly as a father, husband, brother, a son, uh, very, very grateful to him uh, and very, very proud that today India is a, sh is a beacon, not as a democracy alone, is a beacon to our women power, beacon to our youth power, to the rest of the world. And I, I have the uh, distinct honor of meeting a lot of people around the world. And I can tell you that uh, around the world, there's a great deal of admiration for how we have transformed the women and youth of our country in terms of the opportunities that they have uh, for themselves and for their future. You know, Minister, I found it quite curious that uh, the, the, the finance minister should mention the India-Middle East-Europe alliance as a strategic economic game changer for India at a time when there's this raging war in West Asia, there is a threat of this conflict spilling over, it already has. Um, and yet, it's, you know, it, it is something which could be huge for India going forward. Um, but would you not agree that it is curious that the mention of this at a time when things have clearly gone no. south in West Asia? No, I, not at all, not at all. And I think this is, I think the difference between how we have traditionally thought of opportunities in our future and how our Prime Minister thinks of it. He is thinking of this as multi-decadal. He is thinking of this as over the next many, many decades. It is clear that this corridor, the largest democracy in the world, India, one of the largest economies in the world, India, transiting through the Middle East and then connecting with the US is certainly going to be one of the more important and trusted corridors for trade, for wealth creation, for economic opportunities in the coming years. <clears throat> because it is bound by uh, a certain common, not just values, that word is overused and uh, over, uh, uh, you know, misused as well. But really there's a common set of long-term sustainable interests that binds this corridor. Now, in, in I would argue, and I'm not a geopolitical expert as you are, Vishnu, that some of these conflicts that you are seeing today is a result of this redrawing of the global geopolitics. There is resistance to this chain. There are interests that are going to be uh, extremely concerned that there is this redrawing of uh, these types of corridors and partnerships. And I think that is certainly why you can expect that these kind of redrawing and these changes will not be without challenge, without, will, will not be without vested interest trying to sabotage it and uh, upend it. So, I, I don't think that should be the way to look at uh, what we think this is going to be a very defining corridor in the coming decade. Uh, this is certainly a short-term problem. It is a short, certainly a short-term uh, issue that needs to be addressed by the countries in the Middle East. And I suspect that over time it will be. But, uh, but it, the, the fact and the truth about the fact or the reality of this corridor being the defining economic trade corridor for the future of the world is certainly, in my opinion, not subject to any dispute or question. A final question, a statistic by <coughs> the minister that the average real income of people has increased by 50%. This, in a sense, is the bedrock upon which uh, you know, any plan or program or any aspect of the uh, economy uh, is, is really premised on, that people earn more. I mean, it's a clear sign of progress. Um, could you share with us, you know, I mean, how, how has this data on real income been calculated? Because it's tough to understand. I, 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 I certainly don't have access to that data, but I certainly uh, have absolute faith in our finance minister that she is quoting out of real data and real facts. 
and empirically and anecdotally there is enough evidence to suggest that there has been a significant growth in real disposable income income in the hands of people to spend on themselves invest in their families and the futures of the families <coughs> simply take an anecdotal uh, say, take the instance of the tax labs yeah. the in 2014 the exemptions were at 2 lakhs and today it is almost at 7 lakhs so i think if you look at all of the connect all the dots which is the only way i can uh, respond to this question because i don't have the data sure. that the finance minister has access to certainly this issue uh, is, is very very credible and it's absolutely uh, sounds more than uh, realistic because of the just simple connecting of the dots in terms of job opportunities income growth uh, skilling that is driving upward mobility and entrepreneurship investment that is going in and of course the tax slabs uh, that have been moved from 2 lakhs to 7 lakhs that gives more and more disposable income uh, to the to the to the user to the citizen so i would uh, i i think you are right that that is certainly the bedrock in terms of measuring any government's uh, commitment to its people and that the, we have grown our economy and we have grown the real income of our people are the two, and that we have taken 25 crore indians out of uh, multi dimensional poverty i think these three things should tell us a lot about what has happened in the last 10 years all right <coughs> yeah, mr rajiv chandrashekar always great speaking to you thank you very much for joining us